to start off uh, telling you a story. Dr. Darrell just told you that I had this phenomenal team, so I got to tell you where I started. When I was five, the teacher gave me needs improvement in works well with others. Do y'all do have those those report cards when you were? It was all about social interactions and you you know all those little things. I have no idea what my other marks were, but I know that I got needs improvement in works well with others, and I hauled that baggage through decades of my life. When I was in my late twenties, I was. Um, leading a volunteer organization and I got fired as a volunteer. See, doesn't work well with others, works well, needs improvement. And those two things were painful for me, but I really, looking back now, feel like those were the catalyst, those were the, the uh, red letter events that turbocharged my desire to become really good with people. And I don't know where I'd be now. Maybe I'd be good with people. Maybe I was good with people all along and I was just deluded. Um, but because that created such a focus for me, that's like this is where I've been focusing my attention pretty much ever since then. And you know, I'm an overnight success after 35 years. Um, and anyway, I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned. Uh, when um, Dr. Passwater asked me to do this, well, what worked, what didn't work, what'd you do, what'd you try, you know, what was your process? And I kind of focused in on that for a while and it, it, it finally kind of felt like it wasn't the right place to start. And then my uh, professional coach challenged me with some purpose questions and, you know, what would success look like and, you know, what do you, where, where does this come from? And that really clicked for me because in my experience of working with teams and, and just getting good with being with people, it doesn't have anything to do. Well, it has something to do with the things I did, but that's not where you gotta start. Um, for me, the, the place that it starts, and I, these are just principles, and I don't know that they're in any particular order, but number one, personal involvement. Hello, come in. Um, personal involvement, team building, working with, it's not an outside-in undertaking. It's an inside-out undertaking. If I'm gonna be a good team leader, I have to be willing to be a member of a team. I, I can't just call in the consultant and say, hey, make these guys a team for me, will ya? I'll be over here, I'll tell them what to do, and you make them a team. Uh, the this, this story that I have to go with that, I call the uh, $50,000 consulting engagement. I had been kind of wrestling with uh, working with people, and I felt like I'd gotten good, but we were, uh, we just were stuck. It seems like we just couldn't get over a hump as a team. And so I thought, I'm gonna bring in, I'm gonna bring in some consultative help. And the guy sat across the desk, and we had a three-year plan, and it was all this thing that was going on, and it was $50,000. And I was gonna have to go to my board and convince them to spend $50,000. And somehow that just didn't feel right. Somehow that didn't feel right, and I thought, I'm gonna do this myself. I, have, I am going to get to where I can learn to do this myself. This whole idea that I can have, that team building is something that I can have done, it, it's, it, while I do something else, no. That's when I went into uh, coach training. I got trained as a certified effectiveness coach and those, hello, those uh, skills um, really stood me in good stead. So it was this, you know, I had to be, in per I had to be personally involved. Um, the, the next thing that came up for me is personal commitment. One of the reasons that my team is as successful as it is is because I knew they could do it. I was convinced before there was any evidence that they could be a great team. I believed in them before they believed in them and I believed in the process and it's like that belief was critical in, it, it's just, I don't know, it creates an energy that just sucks people into a place of possibility. Um, and people have to be able to, you gotta let them goof up. People gotta goof up. Uh, next story I have is called the $20,000 training program. I had a person who was kind of new in her job. She was very hesitant, very kind of mousy, quiet kind of person. And she, uh, she struggled and people were a little impatient with her. She just kind of was, you know, not quite making it. Well, she had a, a, a job that involved uh, releasing titles. 
when somebody pays off a car loan, you give them their title back. They get their pink slip. Well, this particular member had refinanced their car. So they paid off this car loan and took another car loan. And when she saw that this car loan had been paid off, she released the title. Now, this loan has no collateral. Well, the member, being not very dishonest, uh, not very honest, thought, I ain't lucky day, went right to DMV and took the lien holder off. Now, she owns the car. I have nothing but my own good looks to help to have her give that title back, and she refused. Well, the worker bee was apoplectic, naturally, because that was a $20,000 car loan that just became unsecured. Are you going to fire me? No, I just spent $20,000 training you. I had a few experiences like that, and that's, you know, I think that's another part and parcel of creating a, a good team is that people got to know that it's okay once in a while. I mean, you can't be dumb forever, but if you, yeah, you know, it's like she, it, was an, it was an honest mistake. She didn't, it was kind of, she should have paid attention. She didn't. She was new. She didn't have anybody shadowing her. It was, you know, like I was much as fault as, as, she, as she was as did. So I spent $20,000 training her. It was, it was okay. Another thing that I think is really, is really critical is congruence. I have to be the same on the inside as I am on the outside. If I'm saying something and how my body is or how my energy is doesn't match it, you know what you're going to hear? Wah, 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 wah. Right? The team can't, it, it cannot hear what I'm saying if my, if my actions, and I, I've discovered that it goes deeper than my actions. I can make actions match what I say. But if my heart doesn't match it, you are going to know it in a heartbeat. You, you are just going to know it. Uh, the, the best example that I have of what I mean by congruence, um, I, my coach, uh, professional coach, has a uh, horse. She does equine workshops. She does a lot of work with, uh, with horses. And horses, I did not know that. Horses are herd animals, which you know. They are also prey animals. That's my phone texting me. Ugh, I'm sorry for that. It's going to do it again. Let me shut it off. We'll just have to take your phone. Oops. <laughs> it's a good thing I asked you to turn off your phones, right? OK. Um, the um, uh, horses are also prey animals. I mean, they're big. I don't think of horses as being prey animals, but things like cougars and wolves and what have you prey on, on uh, horses. Well, if the cougar is hungry, right, it's chilling. I'm cool. I'm a cougar. But it's watching because it's cool on the outside and hungry on the inside. What does the herd do? The herd knows it. The herd moves to safety. If the cougar has eaten, it can sit in the middle of the herd. The herd knows it's cool on the inside or cool on the outside, full on the inside. It's congruent. Congruent is safe. Incongruent is unsafe. It's an important part of, being a, part of being in a team, which leads to my next point, which is vulnerability-based trust. I think one of the things that has really allowed my team to, uh, to gel and to grow and to really be willing to take risks and move forward is that I have been willing to do it in front of them. I mess up in front of them. I make amends in front of them. I cry in front of them. I have. I honestly, I have done it. Um, I question. I wonder. I confess. I, I'm me. I'm just real. And that gives them permission to wrestle and do stuff that they maybe are a little uncomfortable with because they know that I've been uncomfortable and I've survived. They've watched me survive being uncomfortable. Um, the, one of the biggest stories uh, for me of you know, moving to vulnerability-based trust I call this one. And then there's favoritism. I was at a, a Convene uh, CEO summit. It was my very first one. And there was this guy who was speaking. He looked like Matt Damon. <laughs> I, I was having a hard time listening to his talk because he looked like Matt Damon. Uh, anyway, he was talking about uh, sin in the workplace. And he spent a lot of time talking about affairs and men and women and not being together and doing you know, a lot of uh, you know, uh, lust and what have you. And I'm just kind of going, OK, yeah, fine. <laughs> Snoring away. Then all of a sudden he said, and then there's, you know, then there's kind of those other uh, little things. And he named three things. I don't remember what any of the three of them, uh, but one of them. And then there's favoritism. Ugh! It, it was like I uh, stabbed in the heart. I had a coworker at that time. Here I'm trying to build this team. 
I had a coworker at that time who was heaven for me. She just, oh, she made life easy. There was things, she, she took real good care of me. But the feedback that I got from my team is that she was awful to them. And I was like, I wasn't listening. Deal with it, deal with it. I had all kinds of, I explained away every complaint I had ever had about this person and the way she was with the team. And then it's like, cause I was in heaven. Then I realized, whoa, it was like a ton of bricks. All of a sudden I realized I gotta come clean. So I got all the people who had complained to me in a group, apologized and said, I'm now ready to listen. What is it that you need to tell me? And they told me. Then I needed to get with the person I had been allowed to do stuff that she shouldn't have been doing and say, um, we're new game. We're not doing this anymore. That was harder. The people I apologized to, they were, they were tickled with that. The people, when I said, this thing you're doing, I am doing favoritism, been allowing you to do this, and I can't, it's not consistent with what we say our values are, and we need to shift and do something different. That was hard. I cried a lot of tears, and I, I, I soldiered on through that. Wouldn't have made it if it hadn't been for my convene group, um, but we finally lived through that, and, and that person eventually moved on. Um, the other story that I had is, uh, is much more recent. Um, I was with, I do a thing called team tracking. A Couple times a year, I take my key people out for lunch and just let them talk. Sometimes they have something that's business related, sometimes they have something that's personal related. I ask how I can pray for you. Um, I just kind of check in with their lives and what do you need me here and, and I do my team tracking. And this uh, one young fellow that I was uh, with last year, he started to tell me about what was going on with him and his faith. And it was like, he was having a crisis of faith. Like, is God really real? And, and he was in it. And I just kind of went like, no, 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 no. You know, Cause he had been, the last time I had had that kind of discussion with him, he was rock solid. And now he was drifting. I was like, no, come back. And then I, as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I thought, oh, I stomped on him. I didn't let him be who he was. I didn't let him figure out for himself. I didn't, I didn't honor him. I was rude. I just felt rude. So I backpedaled. And I invited him to talk. I was, I, you know what, take that back. And I, I invited him to talk. And I still felt bad. A couple days later, I called him into my office and said, I need your forgiveness. I told him what I thought I'd done and why I thought it was rude and that I needed his forgiveness. Oh, no, that's OK. No, no, it's not OK. And thank you for being quick to forgive me. But I just want you to know that I take it seriously. I dishonored you. I would never want to do that. And I, I need your forgiveness. And I think that's. That's important. That's that's a part of it. I, I got to be able to be, you know, be, come clean. Consistency and buy-in. Um, Dr. Darrell and I talked about this even just tonight. Is that not? It's not only important for me as the leader to be committed to the team and to you know doing the right things, uh, on accountability and so on. It has to go down into the next layers at least. I don't. I have a fairly flat organization. There's me. There's supervisors. There's folks. There's not that many layers. The, what, what has been magical for us is, is those, uh, those concepts and that buy-in is, is resident in those next leaders down. And I think it's because of those team tracking meetings, those come clean meetings that's like, I'm committed to you and I'm committed to your growth and I'm coaching you and you're coaching your people and everything uh, trickles down. Um, in the days before we got going with this, uh, we had a lot of trouble with people would act would behave themselves when I was there. Who knew what was going to happen when I wasn't there? One time I was gone, we had a staff meeting. We have two branches. We have a branch in LA, we have a branch in Long Beach. And the, I, don't, I wasn't there, but I heard about it afterwards. And I guess they didn't come to blows, because it's hard to come to blows 30 miles apart, but it was close. There were, there were accusations, there were recriminations, they were yelling. There was like this melee. It was a free-for-all. And everybody was like shell shocked after that happened. And we had to, there was a lot of mopping up that had to do uh, with that. And we had to really wrestle with that. What is going on that people know that a certain behavior set, a certain set of behaviors is uh, expected when I'm in the room and that all bets are off when I'm out. And to me, that meant that the leaders right below me were not being appropriately supported. They were not taking seriously. Somehow I did not, I had given it away, but not really given it away. If they thought that, you know, when that person was in the room, that somehow they didn't have the same authority that I did. And so we had to go to work on that. It has to go down into the organization. Um, I'll, I'll tell a story on somebody that's not me. I call it the flat organization. 
where I'm concerned for a friend that may be heading for some murky waters uh, because he has a flat, flat organization. It's like him and everybody. And there's things that aren't working well. And he doesn't have, there's like nobody but him. They don't have sub teams that they can gel with and they don't have processes for um, managing their conflict or, or working through issues because there's no, there's no structure. So I'm, I'm concerned for him because his flat organization I think is gonna have some problems. Another thing that's really important is feedback. We gotta be able to talk to each other. Um, I spend time um, involving people in the process. When we first started, we did a survey. Yeah, how are we doing as a team? Did a survey. It wasn't that great. And then we did some stuff and we worked on it. And the next year we did the survey again. We got a little better. We got a little better. And then we thought, we're good at this. So I let them craft the questions. I let them be involved. There's not, there's not them, right? It's us. It's all of us. Um, I ask them, what, do, what, is, what is it that I'm doing that supports you? What can I do to support you? What am I doing that you want me to stop? What do you want me to do? To keep, I keep doing. What do you want me to start that I'm not doing? Um, and what are you doing that you think is really stupid? You know, people do stuff because the boss says so or because we've always done it that way, and it makes no sense. And so I'm always inviting people to say, you know, what are you doing that you think is colossally dumb? What systems are fighting you? What, is, what bugs you? And which brings me to lean thinking. We'll get to that a little bit later, hopefully, if we have time. I think you've heard a little bit about that. Um, the last thing in the foundational piece, the who you got to be, um, I call it character. But what I do, which I think has been, I wouldn't say it magical, but it's darn close. Each and every staff member is part of their developmental process. When you come to work for me, within the first six months, you will craft a value statement and a personal mission statement that are consistent with the value, mission, vision, and values of the organization. So we start with values. What the research has shown is that if a, if a person, uh, say you're, you are, um, you're comfortable with the values of the organization, I know what we're here for, I'm good, but you're a little murky on your own, you've never really sat down and thought about it. That will create a certain ethos. You might not give a rip about the organization's value. I'm here to collect a paycheck. Come on. And you maybe don't care about your own values either. So you're just kind of showing up. So there's, see there, well, there's four, four combinations, right? You can have, you can not, care, not know either one. Don't know the organizations, don't know my own. I can know my own, but not the organization. I can know the organization, but not my own. Or I can know both. Not surprisingly, the ones who don't embrace either have the lowest performance, right? The people that are good with both have the highest performance. Who would you expect to have the next highest performance? Who would you expect a person that knows theirs but not the organization or a person that knows the organization not their own? What do you think? Knows correct. That is correct. The, the research has shown that a person who knows their, who, who is based in their own values but isn't quite, doesn't, isn't quite familiar, not quite sold on the organizational value, organization's values, will perform almost as well as the one who knows both. And the one that, it, that doesn't know their own but knows the, the organization will perform less th well than the one that knows their own. So we say, okay, the, the foundation is in my personal values. I gotta know who I am. So they have, their, they, they have to have their value statement and that connects them to our values in a way. It's magic, I don't even know, but that's all uh, required. What happens then is that when they have their own mission and they have their own values, they're leaning into the organization's values. They understand, wow, they, they feel what it does to themselves as a human being to be a leader of their own life. You are the CEO of your life. As the leader of your own life, you, uh, you then have this energy that can lean into, the organi into, into what's going on in the organization. You have the ability to post your flag next to the flag of the organization, and everybody has that flag. It's exciting, I mean, it is exciting. And it, I think it communicates value. When I take time, energy, and money from the organization and say, I'm gonna sit with you, I'm gonna interview you, I'm gonna see what's important to you, I'm gonna help you craft that value statement, I'm gonna help you craft that vision statement. And then we do kind of a public rah-rah when, you know, when it gets framed up and ready to go on their, in their office. Um, that everybody wants to be somebody. You get to be somebody. You're an important somebody. Look at the thinking that went into this person's value statement and what's important to them. It's just, it's exciting. 
Um, so that's kind of, that, that, that's what kind of percolated up for me and like how do I have to be? How do I have to show up as a leader and how do I have to invite other people to show up so that they will be the best they can be as an individual and therefore be able to move into a space that can craft a team? I notice I haven't done a thing. We have had zero team building exercises yet. It's, you still gotta, you gotta start with, with who you are. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna transition uh, a little bit into what we did. There was stuff that we did. Uh, we uh, did a lot, we tried a lot of different things and where we ended up with, with really seemed like cookies on the bottom shelf was with Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. How many of you are familiar with that? Some of you have read that, it's a great, uh, it's a great read, it's very quick, it's kind of an allegory, sort of a story story. Well, he has a workbook that goes with it, overcoming the five functions of the team. That was sort of our team building Bible, if you will. Um, if you remember, so if you've read it, you start with, that's the foundation place of where a team starts. If you don't have trust, you're not, uh, you're not gonna go anywhere. Um, a couple of the things that we did in the place of establishing trust is uh, we, we do personality assessments. Everybody knows their DISC style. Anybody familiar with DISC? Myers-Briggs, different, you know, we used to use Myers-Briggs a lot, now we use DISC. Um, we understand our own style, we understand the styles of other people, we understand the strengths and weaknesses of each style. Your D's, you want them to act, make your decisions. Your C's, you want to make sure the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Your S's, you want to make sure that they got lots of people to be nice to. And the I's, you want them to put, you want to put them in the front and have them run the show. They're, you know, they're image, image folks. And then we can, when people act differently than us, it's not such a big deal. If, you know, if you're different than I am, I expect you to be different. If your style is very different than mine, then I don't think that you get up every morning figuring out how you can hack me off, because you are weird. That all goes away. Um, life on life sharing. We do stuff together. We go to the beach, we go to the park, we go to the, we, you know, you just gotta do a little life on life. Churches do that, businesses can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Anybody that says, do not be friends with your people, throw that out. Be friends with your people. Um, and then letting people survive mistakes. We also had some conversations about what it means to trust. There are people who say, oh, 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 you gotta earn my trust. I will trust you when you prove to me that you can be trusted. My research indicates that trust is something you give, not something you earn. If I say, I'm gonna, I'll trust you when I figure out you can be trusted, what am I looking for? I'm looking for you to screw up. I, if that's what I'm looking for, if I have suspicion, if I have cynicism, how are you ever gonna, you, why are you gonna wanna bother? I'm looking for you to mess up, that's where I'm looking. If I'm looking for you to be trustworthy, it's because I've given you my trust. Will you break trust? Are you a human being? Are you a sinful human? Will you? Yeah, you will. So it's like if I go in saying I'm giving trust, I am gonna assume you are trustworthy, and if and when, because you're a human being, you break it, we'll go about building trust. We will rebuild trust. Trust can be built and rebuilt. It's, it's something you give, not you, well, I, if you've broken it, you kinda gotta earn it back, but I still think it's building, it's not earning. I think that's an important distinction. Okay, next thing up, conflict. Gotta manage conflict. And this doesn't mean you gotta learn how to fight fair. Uh, it means that you need to learn how to be comfortable or live with the discomfort of being in conflict. Not fighting, but disagreeing. People need to be willing to be you and me against the problem, focusing on the issues, not person or personhood. We're not insulting, we're not um, uh, picking on people. There is, a certain, there is a certain value in discomfort. If, when you're uncomfortable, how many of you would agree that some of your biggest growth spurts, if you will, have had an experience where your growth spurt came from a place that you were really uncomfortable? Almost, almost everybody. So there's some value in saying, you know what? This is gonna be a little hard. This might feel a little uncomfortable, but we're gonna move through it. Uh, now we're aware, because we've done our DISC assessments, that our S styles, our people, our harmony people, and our um, I styles, they're, they're kind of sensitive to criticism. They will have the most trouble with it. The D's blasting right through. The C's is there's a right way to do it, let's do it. 
So we're aware of that, and so we, we build hedges around the people that are a little bit weaker, right? The weaker brother, we want to move, along, move alongside. Um, the, the, speaking the truth in love, we, we got to be able to be honest with each other. Uh, we've done generous listening in this place. Um, John Townsend has a really cool um, thing called Eight Steps to Effective Confrontation, where you say, I'm for you. You give a, an affirming message. You say what the problem is. You own your part. We're, at this, we're in this tight place because of this that I did. What do you think? What the request is? If, what the consequences might be if things don't work well? And again, I am for you. So this, is, this was probably one of our harder ones because people don't like, you know, you say conflict. Doesn't that sound like, that doesn't sound like fun. Uh, but working through that, working through conflict. Next thing is commitment. Everyone has to be rowing in the same direction. Uh, one of the places that we started through with, started with this is, yeah, every organization has a mission, vision, values, got that mission statement on the wall. What is that mission statement? I don't know, that's something they put on the wall. We take that out and revisit it. Is this still who we want to be? We've tweaked it a couple times. I let my, you know, this is not something that comes down on from on high. We didn't bring in the consultant. Actually, they did. Bring in the consultant, and this was before my time. Bring in the consultant and stick the thing on the wall. Never talk about it. But well, we talked about it. And then it's like, well, what do you think works there? And what don't you think works there? And we've tweaked it. We've massaged it a little bit. It has morphed over time. And they get to participate in that mission, vision, and, and values. Um, Another thing I put under a commitment that, that we've done, I think it may come and it may it, it touch on trust as well, and that's affirmation. We have a staff meeting every week. We uh, meet from 8 to 10. We start every single meeting with affirmations and acknowledgments. We, we notice what people did that was praiseworthy the previous week. Oh, I really want to affirm Juan. The report that he wrote was spectacular. I, it was clear as a bell. Nobody will see it but me and the board. It was awesome. Oh, I really want to acknowledge so-and-so. I, I was having a tough time getting stuff processed, and she came through and helped me. And so then we all hear what's going on, and you should see them. You should, you should see them. There are people that say, oh, I don't, I don't need those affirmations. I don't, I'm, I'm OK with that. And then when somebody will say, I have an affirmation for Rebecca, everybody goes, woof, and she says, oh. Really? Me? Yes. You. Uh, everybody, I think everybody likes affirmation. And when someone knows that they're going to be acknowledged for something they've done, they're much more willing to make the commitment to what the group has decided they're going to, they're going to do. Uh, under this is uh, also creating consensus and clarity. What is it that we're talking about? You know, sometimes we, oh my goodness, we had our last strategic planning retreat, and we spent uh, a whole day working on stuff. And by the way, I do strategic planning with my staff. That's not something that the board does and overlays on the staff. The staff does it and delivers it up to the board. And so we, we, had, we had all these brainstormings, and we did all this kind of stuff. And we, we got all, all down to the, the, to the end. And um, one of the, she's not a junior person. She's she got five years with the organization. She said, I'm really uncomfortable with this. It sounds like we're biting off more than we can chew. And it was like all the, room, the air sucked out of the room. And I thought, oh, I screwed up again. And then I realized, no, that was the most valuable feedback we got. All this stuff we wrote was good, but it doesn't have to be done today. So what happened with that is that we created, that we were able to move in and create a new consensus of what are we about. We said we're going to have two wildly important goals. These aren't it. Let's save this. Let's focus. And then and limiting the number of goals. Once they've made a commitment, guess what? This is a you. Uh, accountability. People got to know that, that what they said they were going to produce, that, is gonna, that they're going to be expected to produce it. Um, the first time I used this word in a staff meeting, um, you'd have thought I'd suggested something really heinous like you know, trafficking or drug, you know. It was, it was scary. The people go, whoa, that sounds like uh, catching people do something wrong and calling them out. No, no, no. The, the accountability that counts is when I say, I've made a commitment to do something, and I want you to help me. I want you to be my partner. I want you to give me feedback. I want you to tell me when I'm moving towards that, and warn me when you see me moving away from it. So th then we become partners in creating our results. So accountability, then we have, we have scoreboards, we have key metrics, we have, we have our scoreboard. Uh, 
I don't know, have you talked anything about uh, key metrics in business? Is that any of the concepts that you've talked about in here? Where you, you have a business and you, you, know, you figure out what is, it, what is it that counts? What is it that shows that we're successful? And how do we measure it and what behaviors contribute to it? We've, we've finally, we worked five years to get our good uh, metrics, but what they do, and they sit around, it's part of their accountability. Like, okay, our percentage of such and such was uh, in the uh, yellow bucket this time. What, what do we think caused that? What behaviors can we adopt that will support that? So it's not, it's not a negative thing. Accountability is a positive thing. Um, another thing we do at the end of each year, everybody has a development plan. I said that, maybe I didn't. Mission statement, value statement, development plan. What goes in the development plan? Well, we do a thing called feed forward. Um, we get around in small groups and I share, here is one thing about working with you on a team that I think is super awesome and here's one thing about working with you that's really hard for me. And I didn't say it was bad. I just said, this is, oh, this is super duper. This is the best thing about working on a team with you. And this is hard for me. And everybody gives that to everybody. Now you can decide if you want to take on that hard for me. Let's talk a little bit more about that. And it's speaking the truth in love. And everybody has an opportunity to come out with one or more things that they want to then work on. And that goes into their development plan. So, and, and feed forward is, you know, you say, well, feedback. Well, there's the thing you did wrong. That's feedback, right? Feed forward is here's the thing about you that's hard for me. And you might try this, this, and this going forward. That would help make that better. That's feed forward. OK, last thing. I could be taller. Results. We want to get what we want. That's where our key metrics come in. And then we measure our behaviors. All this stuff rolls up. Um, we need to be willing to. Everybody needs to be willing to subordinate the needs of a specific team to the needs of the whole group. Uh, now, for me personally, even when working with the Patrick Lencioni stuff, it's like, okay, who's the team? I've got my operations team, I got a loan team, I got the leadership team. I got it. In my mind, I think of the whole organization as the team. It is one big team. We are one for all and all for one. And at, we're only at 14, so we, we've been able to maintain that pretty well. Um, but it just seems like that's. Uh, we're all willing to do what it takes to help the whole team. And people go out of their way to, to help the, the whole team. Um, the last two things I have under this category, uh, it, it, lean thinking. Um, I, don't, I think uh, Dr. Passwater showed you some of the lean, I don't know if you saw any of the Paul Akers stuff, this you know, two second lean, fix what bugs you uh, kind of stuff. I really feel like this impinges on results um, because people can, um, you know, figure out how to do things better. So much more is possible in the area of results once we start into this lean thinking. And then the last thing is celebrate. Uh, we, we have, remember the, uh, the gas, or no, uh, it was Starbucks cards. When they hit the target, give them gas Starbucks cards. Oh no, they don't want that. They want the million dollar lunch. They have the million dollar lunch. We had the million dollar lunch yesterday because they hit the million dollars a day ahead of time. The, the job of the loan team is to produce $1 million of cons funded consumer loans, and they get to have lunch on the credit union when that happens. Well, we got Rebecca, whose job is lunch, uh, and she makes sure that we have the million dollar lunch. They're happy as can be. They, so anyway, we celebrate, and we celebrate every time we hit it. We don't wait till the end of the year. Celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. OK, that's kind of my spiel. Thank you for paying attention. I saw eyes. That was very, very cool. Um, I'm not sure what our time is. I know you wanted to talk a little bit about lean. And Unfortunately, I left my computer in my office. I'll go get it. But I'm, so oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. We, I can talk about it. We, don't, we, can, we can talk about how it applies. Or I can take questions. Questions work too. Questions. I can, I'm going to point to people. I'm gonna, the question is going to be, what's one thing you heard me say? I'll look for a friendly face. Yeah. Oh, there? Other, Honey. Um, you talk about emotional attachment, like being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have problems with that where you're too emotionally attached to your employees? Um, I'm going to say yes and no. I feel safe in crafting the emotional attachments I've made. First off, I am 100% for every single person who works for me. I adore every single person who works for me. That just, that takes an emotional attachment that, I mean, I, I have to bleed when you bleed. I, ju I just do. Now, if you mess up really, really bad and you go off the deep end of foreverness and I have to say bye-bye to you, that hurts. 
that hurts everybody. And I think it's worth it. Um, it means I'm slow to pull the trigger on that because I love you and I don't want to lose you and I'm going to try everything to mitigate and mediate and remediate and get you back on track and everybody around you is going to do the same thing. And every single person that I have had to let go over the last five years has been done very slowly, maybe agonizingly, painfully, stupidly slowly, but every person that's left knows I, I will be I will have every opportunity to get back on track if I hit a tough spot. I just, I think it's, I'm just, I'm just committed to that. I am slow. Now, I'm, we hire a lot better, I will tell you that. And we've had, we, we have some people, I have one person who I consider magic. If Sharita says on a hire, it's no. I don't care what anybody else says. She does, her record is 100%. Well, you know, I told them not to hire, what? When was I gonna hear this? Well, I told them that I, this is what I saw, when it, and now, it, I, oh. now she doesn't do I told you so, but it's like I've just learned. It, you put Sharita, in the, put Sharita on the panel, and she says no, it's no. She says yes, it's yes, and then she's committed. She's an HR. She's committed to helping that person uh, uh, go forward. So I, I, I have had, I'll tell you a story. I got a story for that. Um, my buddy, Fid. Uh, when I first started at the credit union, there was a person who was a well-seasoned um, employee and a little... A little, a little something. Um, she had a sign on her desk that said, I don't get mad, I get even. <laughs> okay. The consultant who was the uh, part of the executive search that found me um, kind of put me aside and she goes, she's going to be trouble. You better get rid of her quick. And I thought, I don't think so. I, 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 them's, that's a challenge. I'm going to take it. So I made it my business to connect with her first. I, I wanted to know, what are you doing? What do you see that's valuable? What do you want me to know? What do you do that's stupid? What do you, would you like to change? What do you, what do you really want to be when you grow up? I really, and after a while, you know, I really didn't want to like you, but you're okay. Score! <laughs> so anyway, we, I, I invited her to do things with me. We became buddies. She worked with me for 16 years. And then it wasn't so good. I put her in a position, I kind of created a position for her. She had some you know, hand surgeries and there were some things that she would, you know, so I made up a position for her. She could have grown into it. She could have taken, she kind of hung back and went, well, just do me what, just tell me what to do. No, you need to be the driver. You need to be the person that's asking the questions. You need to be proactive in this. And then 2009 happened. And my leadership team said, so, are you going to deal with this? Well, I'm coping she'll retire. Are you going to deal with this? She's not doing it. We have, to have, we have to pay other people to do the job she's doing. I forewent a raise because you're fully funding this position. You could outsource this function for half the price. What are you going to do? So I went to the board and we talked about, I ended up doing a job elimination. Now she had the most spectacular severance package known to man. Uh, huge, um, what do you call it, parachute. She landed safely, but she was mad at me. She wouldn't let me hug her. She wouldn't let me talk to her. She, she just emptied her desk and left and did not speak to me for four years. And then her mother got sick. And then she called me. And she, I listened to her tell me the story of her mother's onset of her illness and what she had to go through and at the hospital and this and everything and what she needed. And, and I listened to the whole thing. And I, I just listened. And how can I support you? How can I help you? What can I do? What do you need? And I was there for her. And when we were all done, she said, I've missed you. <gasps> Thank you. Thank you for what you did. I said, what can I do for you? She said, you already did it. Well, really, what was it? You listened with your heart. Score. I, that was painful. That was a painful four years. And the re relationship is not mended. And she still probably hates me for terminating her and not letting her coast to retirement. But I did the right thing. I was slow doing it. But everybody knows that I would be slow with them, too. So anyway, good question. Yes, Mike. Kelsey, after that. Sorry. What was your career path like? starting first jobs? And That's an excellent question. I have been in credit union. I was born in a credit union. <laughs> Kinda. Um, I, I have my, my degree is from uh, Cal State Long Beach. 
in the ancient days when I was in school, there was a thing called home economics. Are you laughing? Don't laugh too hard. Uh, they call it something else now. But um, in, in, within the school of home economics, there are, there are five disciplines. You can guess at least two of them. Dietetics, textiles, right? Cooking and sewing. And then there's uh, home interiors, child development, and family finance. Yay. That was my subspecialty, was family finance and consumer affairs. That was big in those days. And I had a wise instructor who set aside a whole class time. OK, what are you going to do with this degree? What can you do with this degree? This degree proves exactly one thing, that you can make 40 bosses happy. That's it. That's all. Don't think too highly of yourself. Well, one of the career paths was credit union. So I did the, as soon as I graduated, I got married, and then took a little time off. And then I went job hunting. And what I did was I looked in the yellow pages. How sophisticated is that? Uh, and I found a credit union. And they sent me, I went out to LA, and I interviewed at this credit union. And then they sent me to um, West Covina. West Covina. And that was my first job as a credit union. I was a loan processor slash teller. And I did that for two years. And then I uh, got a position at uh, Pacific Mutual, Pacific Life now, Pacific Mutual Credit Union in Newport Beach. I was there for 13 years, the last four as CEO. And then I was recruited by this. Um, executive search firm to go to the VA, and I've been there for 21, ah, 35 years in the credit union industry. It's I've really not done anything else. I love it, actually. <laughs> there was a yes. Um, has there ever been a, a person that not necessarily was a, like a problem in in a team, but just didn't quite mesh, and like, and how did you deal with that? Okay, um, being uh, being part of the team. Uh, heck, we've had plenty of that. Um, we, we do the best we can to hire. We use the disk, because that will tell me if I want to hire an accountant, I need a C. If I want to hire a service person, I want an S. If I want to hire a salesperson, it's got to be an I with some D. I, and I know that. So we look for all of that. And then sometimes with experience, maybe not. My salesperson, my best salesperson, had zero credit union experience, came from Best Buy. That's the way to do it. Um, but we had another. Before we got him, there were a couple other people in that same position, very hard position to fill. And he was a lovely man. I liked him. He was a good guy. He was a believer. I liked him. And he couldn't, um, he, he, was, he was kind of figuring out on the chalkboard for a couple of my other staff people. And I eventually had to say, this isn't working. And you know, we had to say goodbye. There, we, he had lots and lots of opportunities. And there were things that, you know, on the behavior side, they like, this is what we need you to do. And the reason why he was at loggerheads with people on the team is that they knew that he wasn't performing. And that when, when you have people that are working as a team, if you have somebody that's not performing, that touches every other job that's related to it. And if you're not performing well, that affects me, and it affects the performance of the whole team. And I'm here for the whole team, so you're on my nerve. And that's, that's the kind of thing that we need. And we watch for that. And Sharita, the wonder person, um, has visits with folks to get them back going with, you know, going with the team. And she has pulled some out of the fire, getting them where they get it. Like, oh, I have to listen to that person that sits next to me, even though they're not my boss. Yes, you do. So, yeah. Yes. OK, I, um, no. Um, that's, th that's shaky ground. You can ask things like, well, what do you do with your spare time? And then when they tell you to go to church, you know what you need to know. Uh, God has been good that way. I have not gone looking for believers, but that's what God has sent me. I have 14 staff members. I have everything from. Uh, you know, nominal believers, I know they believe in Christ. They may or may not be walking the walk. They may not be, you know, it may not be a, the, a prominent feature, prayer, uh, you know, testing the scriptures for things to do and what have you. But I have more, I, I've got a significant majority who are committed believers. And it's just like, thank you, God. I, I can't make it a requirement, but I love that it's there. That's a leadership team, we, we pray. We, every leadership, I have all believers in my leadership team. Well, I have believers, all believers. I had a Buddhist for a while, but not on leadership team. Um, but everybody on leadership team is a committed believer. And all by, angels were singing the first time 
um, we got together with leadership teams once a month and you know anybody that's new to the team we kind of have the we're gonna pray and if you don't want to do that it's okay you just come in late la 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 that's your required spiel you gotta you offer that out no penalty for not being a prayer uh, anyway I was monkeying with a computer and the thing was fighting me and it was, it was 15 minutes late getting started and so I finally got it all situated and I said okay let's begin boom heads bowed whoa look at that I was excited now it's all, all the time let's begin boom heads bow I love it That is an excellent question. Um, the more questions that you can ask, you want to ask those, somebody's gonna hire you. Somebody's gonna be your boss. You wanna ask those questions. I'm really interested in, in meshing with your team. I really wanna know what is important for you. What should, and then watch them. Because they, what they tell you and what they do may not be the same. They may scratch their head like, what kind of a question is that? You'll know where they are in terms of their team development if they're not prepared to answer those questions or they look, like, they look at you like, are you speaking French? Um, but yeah, uh, just keep keep asking. To be bold. Don't be. You're not. You're, um, and a team that you want to be on. They are not going to be afraid of you asking those questions. They are going to be going. That new girl. Did you hear the question she asked? You, you ask and keep nudging and keep asking and, and keep contributing. Be brave. They will love you. And if they don't, you don't want to be there. Yes. That's a good question. That's a good question. It might depend on, uh, I can only answer it from my own perspective. That way it just sounds like your job. Yeah. In credit union land, I don't know if this is true of any other place. I suspect there may be some truth in it. Um, in credit union land, it takes a year to see one of everything. Stuff that happens annually, stuff that happens quarterly, stuff that happens every once in a while, stuff that happens every week, every month, every, you know, there's very cyclical. It takes a year to see one of everything. I would say it takes two years to understand one of everything. That's not magic. Uh, yes, my opinion. That's I'm, I'd say a couple years. And if not, if it's not a fit for you, then you don't hang for two years and suffer if it's not a good fit. Um, but be aware that you know, uh, resume resume readers will look at that. If you've had a job every six months, ooh, I don't recommend that. They, they will definitely notice that, even if there's a really good reason. Good question. More questions? You, you had a, a situation where, um, piggybacking on how much you care for your employees, mm -hmm. that one employee, uh, you, you were overstaffed and you had to, you were going to help her get another job. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Why don't you share that story? Okay. And uh, then, uh, what's the impact, do you think, when you do things like that? Oh, I, well, I just, I think God blesses that kind of stuff. I think he smiles. Um, I, um, I had a, uh, a young woman who um, worked for me as a loan supervisor. And she, she and her hubby were living in Huntington Beach. She was going to school at Long Beach State and working at the VA. They're right next door to each other. Her husband had just completed, see, he'd completed, he was old, they were the same age, but he, he was completing his degree faster than she was. He got a teaching job in Rancho Cucamonga. Ugh. So he was commuting from Huntington Beach to Rancho Cucamonga every day. And they made, they made a commitment that they would do that for a year, because after a year, then she would finish her bachelor's degree at Long Beach, and then they would see what was going on, see if they renewed his contract, and then they would kind of they would start house hunting. Well, after that year, they bought a house in Rancho Cucamonga. Well, you commuted for a year, so I'll commute for a year. Now she's coming from Rancho Cucamonga into Long Beach. That's not the same commute. That's a horrible commute. And I watched her wilt. She was finishing up the school. She was finishing up, I think it was December, where she's gonna be gonna be done. They moved in the summer, I can't remember. But I, by November, December, I could see that her spirit was collapsing. She was spending two and a quarter hours on the freeway in each direction. That is horrible. And so um, 
one day we were we were at breakfast. We were at birthday breakfast. That's part of our celebration. Uh, once a quarter we do birthday breakfast. We were birthday breakfast, and I just out of the blue because I'm such a loud mouth, I said, "Well, I just can't imagine that we can hang on to Diane, not where she's going." She looked at me like, "Oh," you like I just announced that Diane was quitting. No, I was just I was asking. It seemed like a legitimate question. And then later she said, "Yeah, it's killing me." And you know what do you think I should do? I said, "Well." Um, how about if you start looking for a job, and we'll start looking for a replacement, and you can be involved in the re in the person that we choose as a replacement, and w I'll give you release time, whatever you need to do interviewing or whatever you, you know whatever you need to do, and we'll we'll all, we'll all get to the finish line together. It'll be great. That was presumptuous. It was 2009, <laughs> um, the beginning of 2009, the year from hell. Um, anyway, it got to be March. Well, first, we, I, thought, I thought, I'm in trouble. She's going to find a job in a heartbeat. I'm not going to find a person. I'm going to be in trouble, but I'll live. It's better for her to find the job. Well, we've hired our person in March. She hadn't found a job. By June, July, everybody was getting a little antsy. Because here she is in a job that's not hers. The per he's fully acclimated now to the position. She's helped him. It's starting to bother her psychodynamically because he's doing her old job and she doesn't have no job. And she's like making work work. And she knows she's underfoot. And I've got two set fully loaded salaries. And I'm thinking, oh, that was a miscalculation. So I called her into my office and I apologized for not being uh, more, not putting more structure on our agreement, for not kind of putting some endpoints and some milestones and what have you. And I said, so, OK, let's, let's turn up the volume. I am going to get involved in helping you uh, with your position search. So where do you want to be? So we took her home and <laughs> drew a circle. And I went in the credit union directory, and I found the CEO of every credit union that was within that circle. And I sent a letter saying, this is probably the weirdest letter you've ever gotten. I hope you will be patient to read to the end. I don't know about you, but in this job market, I thought it would be really easy to fill my positions because there was tons of people unemployed. And that hasn't turned out to be the case for me. I have, I'm betting that you may have positions that you'd like to see filled with another person, but you don't dare get rid of who you got because there's nothing coming that's better. Um, I have a person who has the following skills and needs to work in your area. And here it is on a silver platter. Here's everything she can do. Here's what she's good at. Let me know. In a week, she had three interviews and two job offers. Whoa, that was cool. It was like angels were singing. I, didn't do, I sent out the letter, but it came over a signature of a CEO. It was, a, it was kind of a winsome letter. It's like, I dare you to read me. <laughs> and, and a couple people read it. And she is still, by the way, she's still at the credit union that she hired with and just moved into a position as accounting manager, by the way. Um, they funded a, a master's degree to help her fund a master's degree. She's a happy camper. She, uh, she sent me a note that I still have it. I have it on my bulletin board thanking me for what I did for her. And it's like, I didn't need to do that. I could have just fired her. I didn't need her anymore. You're we done. You didn't have a job. I'm sorry. But I wanted to take it up a notch. I wanted to do better than that. And, and we did. And I think God blessed that. Blessed her, blessed me. Like relationship is intact. I think I could have terminated her. It wouldn't, have, you know, it wouldn't have been a huge surprise to her because here she is, six months underfoot after the, after what we agreed to do was done. Only she didn't have a job, and I just didn't feel good about saying I'm sorry. Too, too bad. We did. I did something better, and it worked. Any other questions? That was an act of courage. Well, yeah, I've done, done a few courageous things. <laughs> Yes. You, know, you talk about uh, you like 2009 being the year from hell. Mm -hmm. It's probably really stressful in your office. And I, I guess I'm just wondering, uh, in times uh, times that are stressful like that, times of bad stress, how do you keep people motivated and keep people focused? Um, I think it was all this stuff that went on ahead of time. I I all kept I kept pinching myself even through that process. Even though we had hard times, even though we kept looking at the financials and going, oh, another loan loss, oh. We, it was, we booked a half a million dollar loss for that year. Fortunately, we had a lot of capital, so it was funded. Um, but it was, it was painful. But what was weird about it is that all of that was what was, that was like out there stuff. That was the circumstances within the team 
the morale was still remarkably high. We're going to live through this. We're going to beat this. We're going to do it. We're strong. And all that stayed throughout that whole process. And I was always amazed that our worst year, the morale was highest that it had ever been since I was there in that worst year. Because it can, it can toss your team apart or it can, which is what it did. Oh, um, back to the intern question, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so as an intern, how do you like, I always feel like, How long does an internship last? The internship that you're talking about. Like in, eight, in weeks. eight weeks? Oh my goodness. Like a summer session. Oh, that's mean. That's not long enough. <laughs> oh, wow. When we do internships, it's like a semester. Oh my goodness. I can't imagine. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. That's a hard, that, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, eight weeks? Oh my goodness. You can hardly find your locker. I, <laughs> I, you, you threw me. I, that, that would be hard. I would, I would, is the goal of that eight week internship to just check off a box in your education path or is it to be vetted as a potential permanent employee? The second one, being vetted. Really, in eight weeks? Yeah, I guess Okay. Um, okay, think what, here, all right, here's what I would try. Find one person. Find one person that you can really connect with. Check around, you know, like you're gonna, they're gonna assign you somebody to show you to lunch or do something. Pick their brain, ask their, you know, how long you've been there, ask all the, all the kind of questions, scan the horizon, find the one person that you can really connect to, and the higher the better, by the way. You know, you don't, you know, you don't know if you wanna pick the other intern. <laughs> um, and really throw yourself into the work of the business also. Be there early, be there late, ask a bunch of questions. Um, Make yourself indispensable. You can do it. Okay. Um, so you talked about how your board is like willing to like hear. You said that you kind of like with your team, your mm -hmm. leadership team, you create like a plan and like your focus and you set it up to the board. Mm -hmm. um, as like a CEO, like what happens if you don't have a board that is willing to play that ball game? Like, because um, not every company has that kind of culture. So maybe. I don't know, like how could you create these, like this pillar of like trust and bond and like grow your teams and uh, your people if you have a, a different kind of operating system? Kind of, sorry, kind of complicated. Ex excellent question, no, it's a good question. I think, uh, okay, what I would do, if I insert myself into the situation you just described, mm -hmm. I now see myself as the insulator between the board and the team. It's my job now to be the liaison between them and the buffer. So I'm going to be, I'm going to have the hard conversations with the board. I'm going to take the heat from the board. I'm going to one that's going to, you know, the, uh, you know, that's going to have whatever those conversations are going to be. Take the blows, yeah. Um, and then work down with the team. What I needed to do, my board, they were a friendly enough board, but they were not really functioning very well when I first started there. So as time went on. I trim down the amount of detail they get, right? They're responsible for the what. I'm responsible, my team is responsible for the how. All the good stuff's in the how. You know, so their job is to send me in a direction. So if I keep, if I, you know, I work to keep them at that high level, and that's what I would do. If I were in an organization where I did not have this free flow, of, I, I, my key staff is at every board meeting. Every, any board meeting they want to attend, they're there. So that increases their credibility. They have voices of their own that board members are willing to hear. It's like, it's heaven. But I didn't start there. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. One more, Michael. Michael, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Oh my goodness, I've got lots of fun. Um, you, you know what, I'm kind of a crazy woman. Really, what I do for fun? All right, I have a home in the mountains. So once a month I go to uh, the Crestline area and chillax. <laughs> Read books, watch videos. Sleep. Ha. Ah. Um, I am. Now you're going to think this is crazy, but I am the um, I am the chairman of the board, if you will, chairman of the vision team of my mission church congregation. I am having more fun. I love coaching my pastor. 
I love working with him on crafting what's going to happen in uh, board meetings. We've had two since I became chairman. It's been, I can hardly wait for the next one. Who looks forward to a board meeting? I must be nuts. That is fun. Oh, I'll tell you, that is fun. My husband and I like to travel. We just got back from Sedona. We have cats, lots and lots of cats. So playing with cats is fun. Uh, what else do I do? I, I mentor one uh, Biola master's student. I, well, that's more work. That's not fun. No, no, no. She is an angel. She's wonderful. She mentors me as much as I mentor her. I just live for the days. How many days till I get to see Carrie? Um, and then I have, uh, um, I'm part of a three-day retreat movement called Curcio. We get to go away for three days and play. It's not really play, it's work, but it's play. It's, I love going to Curcio. And I like to build habitat houses. But other than that, I haven't a thing to do. <laughs> Building a high functioning team, is there any ego issues, fear issues, or pride issues you guys have to deal with? Why, of course. <laughs> Mostly mine. Uh, that, that's, I think that, ooh, that didn't work. Um, I think that, it's gonna mess this up. I knew that was gonna happen. Okay, I think um, that very place, first place, where I, one of those first places that I started about trust-based, vul vulnerability-based trust is being willing to have that be part of the process. Um, it, if I'm really scared to make a mistake, if I cannot make a mistake, and I've thought about this, I haven't thought about this coming over here, I am not crazy about being laughed at. I am not real crazy about being criticized. And I also know that there's some growth potential in both of those things. So sometimes I do it like this, and sometimes I do it like this. And I think when I do it, it invites them to do it. And it's like, there's stuff that happens. There, there is stuff happening. There is stuff that happened on my team today that I didn't even see that is wonderful. They are wonderful all the time. They are doing wonderful stuff all the time. And I, I think I got them started. I think I got them started. So checking fear. Ego and pride at the door is kind of important. Yeah, and being willing to um, we, being willing to call it out in a gentle way. I, I had Vlad. Ooh, Vlad had a tough time at the beginning. Christine had to sit down with him a couple times, and he made the shift. He is a phenomenal supervisor, a phenomenal leader. And if we had said, "Your ego's too dang big, get lost," you know, you're fired. That would not have been fruitful. And if we had just let it happen, I'd have had turnover, I'd have people leaving, and, and uh, that wouldn't have worked either. So we just, we're all in it together. And, you know, everybody know they all know, everybody cares. They know I care. And like, my, my people just below me know I care about them, they care about me, they care about their people. It's just all wonderful today. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.